right. Well, I am very, very excited to be here with Deb from My Bloody Valentine and various other wonderful um, musical acts. Deb, I am a huge fan of your work, and I'm. it's just an honor to be here with you today. Um, so thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> um, you just got off stage w doing a very epic uh, performance with uh, Thurston Moore, uh, with the latest permutation of the Thurston Moore band. And you've been touring with him uh, as well as Lou Barlow from Sebado. What's it been like to be working with just such musical legends? Uh, it's been great. I mean, the thing with Thurston came about very, very organically, actually through James, who's the yeah the other guitarist. Gotcha. Um, Thurston ended up staying in his flat when uh, he moved to London mm -hmm. and I've known James for a long time so um, thankfully for me James sort of suggested me when they were looking for a bass player so wow. Wow. so it was very you know it was very organic and I didn't actually know what they wanted from me. I think Steve was coming over to Europe to do some stuff with Lee Okay. and Thurston wanted to utilise him when he was around yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to play drums. I thought I was just going in to you know, fill out the noise a bit and yeah. help them practice, but it yeah. sort of ended up just kind of snowballing into this, really. Yeah. And it's been great. It's been yeah. very, very organic, very easy. Yeah. And yeah, very lovely. Yeah. Well, I've, it's so uh, surreal for me to be sitting here interviewing you because I've seen you guys through the years, especially with the uh, sort of the reunion, you know, sort of speak, getting back in the game. I think starting in 2008 or so up in San Francisco, and then at some of the other shows you guys have done uh, at FYF Fest was the most recent in, in Los Angeles about a year ago. And My Bloody Valentine is probably one of the most sacred. Uh, artists that I've ever had the pleasure of witnessing. What's it like? I mean, you know, getting back, you know, with My Bloody Valentine, having a very suc successful year with the uh, MBV album, you know, 22 plus years in the making, really. A lot of fans have been waiting for that. And I remember my friend Mike Funk, who's a college radio DJ and has a very cool show called Mo Pedals. He actually uh, played the new album the very same day it was released. It kind of dropped without a lot of, I mean, initially it was it, online and it was kind of a shock to a lot of fans just that it just it just got posted, so to speak. Yeah, yeah it was it, it, it was just how it happened. I mean, we, yeah. had, uh, we didn't really do any press for it. Yeah. We knew it was coming out, obviously. We knew it was yeah. finished and... Yeah. Uh, I think the initial intention was probably to get it out before we toured. We mm -hmm. started a tour at the end of, uh, well, we did a warm up show at the end of January and started in Seoul yeah. right at the end of January or beginning of February. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it actually came out where we were away, came out while we were in Seoul wow. overnight. We sort of had to sort of sit up and wait and then the wow. website crashed and you know, yeah. and so we couldn't actually hear it. Yeah, it was, yeah. So it was kind of same weirdly the same for us we're kind of we're in yeah. first of all in a band being t we rung from england saying right it's coming out tonight and we're like brilliant yeah. you know because they were ready for it and yeah, yeah. Uh, and then didn't and then the website crashed and, and we stayed up all night waiting for it to actually happen so it, it's crazy deb because i you know there's there's so many artists you know who have just amazing work and to follow up from such a seminal album such as loveless i mean talk about pressure and i'm not sure if you or kevin or belinda or all the folks you know felt a lot of pressure but i know you know as fans one of the most highly anticipated albums uh, that I can actually remember and you know you in the band I mean were you all kind of did you feel really confident about this album or was there some sense of like you know has the landscape scape changed are people gonna receive this um, you know uh, you know given the just the huge cultural and musical impact of Loveless um, what was it like for you as an artist to put out new material after all these years <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> uh, I don't really think you think of it in that way, you know, okay. and I don't think we didn't think of Loveless in that way. Obviously, okay. Loveless wasn't, uh, it, it sort of s evolved over the years, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't like it came out and it was a massive, um, you know, yeah. instant hit. Or it was never been a hit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, so, uh, yeah, I don't think you think of it in that way particularly. I think the initial thing was actually finishing it we, was yeah. as much as a shock to us, as yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and all credit to Kevin because he, you know, had to drive it through. And I think there is a lot of pressure when, you, you know, yeah. it's been that long. Well, there's so. all, you know, and there's many stories, of course, some probably mythical at this point about, you know, Kevin's level of perfectionism and and uh, probably all of you. I mean, just as artists wanting to put out the best possible material. But sometimes as an artist to have that level of um standards you know it sometimes makes you feel like what you're putting out is not quote good enough and um it was really wonderful to see you know some new mbv and clearly it met the high standards that that kevin and and everybody in the band have set for your music i hope so yeah i mean uh, again i don't 
I, I don't know if Kevin is a perfectionist that people think he is. I okay. think he has a very, very strong idea of what he wants. Um, but I don't know if that's perfection okay. at all. You know what I mean? And, and, and I think also, you know, sometimes things happen in music that you don't yeah. always foresee and sometimes they're for the good. And, yeah. you know, and he's, he's sort of, you know, quite open to those things. Yeah. So, again, it's not, I don't think, you know, necessarily that, it, it, you know, things took that long because he was striving to get, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, sometimes y you just don't feel it. You know, and he was off doing lots of other things as well. You know, he did a long time with Primal Scream, yeah. a lot of time. Uh, you know, did, did lots of translation, yeah. lots of other pr production yeah. stuff. And you know, I think yeah, Kevin is one of those people. Who, you know, he's a uh, he needs to feel it. And if he's yeah. not, then he's yeah. not, you know, gotcha. he's not going to do it. And we don't have a record label, so nobody's going. You have to get this out yeah. tomorrow. And frankly, yeah. if they were, that would probably put a halt to everything anyway. So gotcha. you know. Gotcha. Cool. Well, Deb, I, you know, I, again, I've gone to a lot of concerts, um, and I, the, of uh, the loudest ever concert I've ever gone to has definitely been an MBV show. I mean, just amazing sonic wall. And um, interestingly, the second loudest show I've ever gone to was Sonic Youth, and you just are playing with Thurston Moore. So I'm, I'm sensing a really interesting kind of intersection. Um, tonight's show, you know, here at Soho, um, relatively intimate, I think, compared to some of the other venues you guys have been performing, and um, a lot of wonderful sonic energy uh but not necessarily the uh feed me with your kiss you know wall of sound uh <laughs> reverberation where the the windows are shaking and things so is it is it is it i don't know a trip for you to be playing kind of more sort of intimate venues compared to some of the real just sonic blast stuff that you do with mbv in concert uh Yes, yeah? it's okay. a trip. Okay. 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 <laughs> Actually, going to MBV shows, I mean, I felt music sort of sound waves that reverberated, you know, um, organs in my body that I didn't even know I had. I mean, this is like this is like a U.S. government, you know, sonic weapon type. You know what I mean? So it's it's I you guys help me explore my body in ways that I just never knew was possible through music. So. <laughs> That's nice to know. Okay. I should take that thought with me. <laughs> yes, yes. Hopefully it'll be an inspiration for your next album. Well, Deb, I have to be honest, and this, I uh, don't want to put you on the spot, but you and Belinda, I have I, I had and still have huge crushes on you guys. You guys, just through the years, I mean, in terms of the female presence. Just make, he says that to all the girls, no, isn't he? No, no, no. She's, um, <laughs> you know... She is just amazing. You know, especially in the 80s, you know, um, UK indie bands coming up, you know, and um, not always a lot of significant female presence, unless it was, you know, a punk band, the Slits or something like that. But to have an integrated band with uh, almost, you know, equal parts female and male um, wasn't necessarily the norm. And I've always really appreciated with MBV that sort of balance, the gender balance. Yeah, and I think it shows in... You know, in the music, the music can be yeah. the vocals are very androgynous. You, hardly, yeah. you, you don't, can't tell which one's Kevin and Belinda yeah. a lot of the time. They, yeah. You know, and you know, on tour, we always have a very we have a lot of women with our crew, and yeah. you know, it's always very mixed. Yeah. It's you know, yeah, it's it's cool, and I think it just sort of shows in the music. You know, it's not yeah. out and out kind of, you know, though it's noisy, it's yeah. it's still, uh, you know. <laughs> I can't get that song. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's not sort of brutish, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's showing that you know, female power is, female, there's a powerful force there, but it's not caveman style. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Deb, when you were, when you uh, decided to become a musician, um, you know, what kind of stuff were you listening to um, early on? I mean, the slits, you know, punk rock influences. What was, what inspired you early on? Yeah, I mean, I actually slightly predate that, but okay. I my, my first sort of musical thing was at school. I was in a little group, you know, that we put together. Okay. Um, uh, and that was that was sort of slightly predated punk, but punk was definitely the thing that changed. You know, before that, I listened to sort of chart music, and okay. then punk came along, and it completely changed th my attitude. And it was largely that thing of like you don't actually have to play an instrument, which was a brilliant so, thing. So many people have said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I still never really mastered that bit, so it's great. <laughs> and it, you know, so it was just, it totally, totally changed. You know, yeah. and yeah, it was uh, the Ramones. Yeah. Uh, love the Ramones, the Bus Cox, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Slits, yeah, yeah, Susan the Banshees. You know, I mean, yeah. it was all that kind of punk stuff, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, the, I, and I was about fifteen at the time. It just completely yeah. changed my world. Cool. Well, uh, Deb, thanks so much for your time. It's a real honor, and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.